Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pro Plus Live. And we have a panel for you on this show, and we would love you to get questions in down in that chat window on your Facebook. Uh, we've tried to mix it up with this show, uh, and we've got uh, AI contributors with varying expertises. Uh, Mo Chatra first. He is the money man. He is the guy that's going to take all your questions and all things finances, and we have some prepared. And uh, Mo's going to stick with us until about nine o'clock. He has got to go and check the first edition of the Financial Times, so he won't be uh, <laughs> he won't be hanging around uh, too long. Uh, this Liverpool stuff's only part of Mo's uh, money expertise. So uh, we'll have Mo Chatra for half an hour. So we'll try and get his questions in first. We've got Dan Kennett, the uh, Liverpool-based stat man uh, and analyst who. Uh, Puts all the numbers together for everyone on uh, Hi, on, on AI Pro. Hi, Dan. Uh, and uh, it, the guys have been watching intently, and I see they've been commenting on the Facebook. So this is their moment to shine. And we've got Simon Brandish, our resident sports scientist. And Simon will be happy to answer anything you have on fitness-related stuff, on uh, on the return of football in, in Germany, in the UK, wherever you want. And we've got Dave Hendrick. Dave's not joining us on video, uh, proving... Finally, I think conclusively, Dave, we can say that you are the more rural of our rural island bunch because there is no way your broadband would cope with video. No, absolutely <laughs> not. I, I live rural. Downey is a townie. <laughs> and there was a one jitter on Trev's uh, on Trev's video feed earlier with uh, with Jan and uh, Steve McMahon. So I think that shows that 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 argument's been put conclusively to bed now. And Dave is here to answer anything you have on transfers, on scouting. I mean, this man watches more football than uh, than probably most of us uh, eat meals. So it's going to be uh, very interesting if you've got any questions there for Dave. So we'll kick things off, and we're going to go to a question that Dan has asked of Mo straight away because uh, we'll get uh, we'll get right into Mo straight away. Do you want to ask it, Dan? Do you remember what it was, or do you want me to fire I it in? I do actually. It's a. It's because it's it's lockdown related, um, Mo. Because um, lockdown has changed everything for the whole world, anyway. But for the Premier League, has it shown us that the Premier League is a very, very large financial bubble? Because we have the situation where we're lo- we're restarting primarily because of TV money, um, and how close is that bubble to bursting? And if it does, so if it doesn't burst, though, but what would we have to change next season to, to manage this better in the future? Yeah, great question. OK, there's so many variables that are there at play at the moment um, when it comes to all types of revenue, not just match day, but even commercial, TV, the whole lot. It's all in a state of flux. So if we could just take it very quickly, t- segment by segment. So with the match day, worst case scenario, no games with fans for the whole of next season. That's £82 million for Liverpool FC as a hit straight away. Massive. Then you talk about TV. So if broadcasters are saying, well, OK, you're not delivering the same product that we signed up to and we want a 10%, 20% discount. Then in the case of uh, the Premier League, the £170 million that Liverpool will be making for winning the Premier League, hopefully this season, will then become £34 million less next season. Again, a huge chunk of change. Champions League money as well. That's, again, very, very significant. Commercial, you know, we're just about to enter into deal with Nike. So when you wrap all of that up together and then you consider the fact that the wage bill alone for last season was £310 million, we'll probably be in the, in the same region for this season and we're still paying off transfers from seasons past. It becomes very, very tight in terms of balancing the books. Whereas, had the season carried on as normal, there would have been no such issue. So, it, it, everything is in a very difficult position for the club. And that's why I can understand why they've been reluctant to pull the trigger when it comes to the Timo Werner deal. Cheers, Bob. Yeah, good answer there, Mo. Uh, one, let's stick on the pandemic side of things and let's open this up to the panel. I'll come to Cy and Dave first. Uh, that, that, does the panel think, this is from uh, Raghav on Discord, he says, does the panel think that this pandemic will cost this Liverpool team and the Klopp era a chance of being one of the greatest all-time teams? Rag states that his reason behind this question is uh, over next season logistically looking tricky at this, this stage and one year out of these players' peaks potentially wasted. Is this a chance mm. for City, United, the money team? teams to uh jump ahead with their deep pockets so uh, let's let's say have that one first and then uh, and then take it to dave oh, it'll be fine. I, I think if anything it might actually give us a little bit of an advantage um because 
our players, we run hot. We we keep the same players, uh, a very small group playing over and over again. Um, and it gives us a chance to get Ali back in the team. It gives us a chance for, for Mo and Virgil and Robbo to um, rest up a little bit um, and finish the season in style. Uh, I, it disrupts everybody else's plans. It just, it's going to hugely disrupt the transfer um, window this summer. Um, I think it's good for us. I think it's good for us for this season. I think it's good for us for next season. I'm not worried at all. Um, I'd agree with Simon in terms of this season and next season, but I think that's quite short-sighted. I think the long-term is where we need to be looking. Klopp has signed a long-term contract. Our players have long-term contracts. And I think what this does potentially do if we decide to become very frugal and the likes of City and United are willing to just go and spend their way you know, back into the, into the conversation is it enables them to shorten the gap you know, in a natural order of things, when when we would be operating the way we are, they might be able to cut back, you know, 15, 20 percent of, of the gap each year. And eventually, four or five years down the line, maybe then United are back level, you know, head to head with us. The way this is going to work out, if, if, if we're not going to spend any money, two years they can be back pretty much ready to challenge us. Um, because of what we're losing out on here. And as well as that, we've got a number of players who are pushing on towards 30. They're all going to crest around the same time at that age. And, you know, really and truly, we needed to be looking at, you know, this window and next summer to ensure that we had the players there to just continue that on. If we're not going to do it this summer, then it leaves double the work next summer or you push it on into the following year, in which case you risk one or two starting to decline. You know, it wouldn't be hard to see a decline in a couple of the midfielders. Um, you know, maybe as he gets a little, little bit older, Mo or Bobby start to become a little bit more susceptible to injuries. I, I don't know. I think for the longer term, looking beyond the next two years, I think looking four or five years, I do think it does harm us. If, if we're going to sit in our hands this summer, I think it's going to harm us. And Dan? It's a really good question because our players, as, as, as the question said, is they are peaking. They are coming to peak ages now, um, especially the front three. Um, I mean, this is the prime of their career right now. Um, and so if, for example, I don't know, just say, for example, we ended up playing uh, the next three seasons over four years, we'd, we would be losing a year of this, these players' time. Now, we might still, we, we might win multiple league titles following this, right? But there'll always be that thing. If we do, if, if things are shortened, um, you know, and things do change in the future, then yeah, I, I, it will hit us harder. But at the same time, we've got a lot of players who are a pre-peak as well. So, um, but obviously not as elite as the ones who are currently right there. But the best news is, is obviously we have the guys, I mean, the, the, the other, no, we've got the, the analytics guys, Michael Edwards in particular, the other clubs haven't caught caught up with us in that respect. They're nowhere near close to us, so not even City. So, I mean, there's no reason why we can't keep that's our biggest advantage um, behind the scenes. It built this team um, with with Klopp, um, you know, attracting the players. But there's no reason why we can't do that again. Anything extra, Mo? Yeah, I totally get everyone's points, and I think the financial situation is what will be the real. Um, kicking the teeth for the likes of Michael Edwards and his team because I'm sure that they more than anyone want to ensure that we build something that's sustainable that's for the longer term and they'll be looking at players with all their statistics and all their metrics knowing okay well this player in all likelihood is going to start tailing off next season or the, or the season after so they would have been planning for all of this but those plans will certainly without question be affected by the financial situation arising from the current crisis so that that's the only thing that will be a difficult one for us to compete against the likes of City and against the likes of United because we don't have the deeper pockets that they have um, so as much as we might like to do the business that we perhaps need to do the financial situation might dictate it ultimately. 
Okay, cool. Well, let's move on to a question from Steve P. And this is again for you all. So uh, I'll start with Simon and we'll see if you've, uh, you, you're a bit less mouse-like this time. Uh, with COVID-19 likely to impact football both in the short and long term, could each panelist state one rule specific to their field of expertise that they'd implement or change for the good of the game? In regards to COVID? In regards to the rules generally going forward, if you could change one rule that would effectively be to the betterment of football, obviously there's things like five substitutes have come in. Would you like to see that continued? Is there something else that you would like to see done in regards to uh, re regards to football going forward on the back of this? Is there a change that this could lead to uh, for future? I would like to see, my, my favourite rule change would be um, the whistle goes when the ball goes out. Oh, really? So you'd like the clock stopped at that point? Yeah. So we averaged 52 minutes of ball in playtime. There were games last season that had, this season that had 43 minutes of ball in playtime. Wow. Catch up, dudes. And we got the fittest team in the league. Um, yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing I would like to see. Biggest difference. And Dave? I, I can only assume those 43-minute games um, involved the likes of Sean Dyche. Roy Hodgson <laughs> and, <laughs> and the dinosaurs of British football. Um, I do like that one. Um, I, I'd like to see the transfer window go back to everybody being, been aligned. I think the window sh needs to open on June 1st for everybody, all countries, regardless of, you know, and not this thing where it opens on June 1st for domestic business and not till July 1st for European business. June 1st window opens, do what you want to do. And, you know, I'm sure there's a way to align where everybody can agree on a date to close the window. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the end of August, but align on a date for everybody so that there's not this discrepancy where, you know, clubs in Spain can buy for two weeks after clubs in England can do. Um, so I'd like to that. But the one rule I'd actually really like brought in is I think you mentioned the five substitutes i'd like to stay with the three substitutes but i think there should be uh, a freebie concussion substitute so any kind of head injury oh yeah it should be an immediate substitution and, and i don't want to hear well the player wanted to stay on i don't oh. want to hear that if it's a head injury get them off simple as that have an independent doctor at every game they can make the assessment put them on the pitch let them look at the player and assess the player and then get the player off. Don't let the player have any say in it because players will never pick the right thing for themselves. They'll always try and sacrifice for the good of the team. And I think you shouldn't lose uh, a substitution if a player has a head injury. I think that's that's one they've got to bring in. That's a great shot. I think, I think, Dan, we've seen that, haven't we, Dan, in cricket? They can actually uh, now bring a concussion substitute in at any time. And that, that guy can yeah. bat and bowl, which was never a thing that any, any sub-fielder could do before. No, that's right, and um, it, it it is it is football's got to move with the times as well because like in, if if you're in the NFL um, and you, you you have a concussion, even if you're the best player on the pitch, you're forced to leave the game. You know, and you just have to deal with it. Um, I, I, that's a brilliant shout from Dave. Um, just on the question though, I mean, I definitely wouldn't want to see the five substitute thing become permanent, and I wouldn't want to see larger substitute benches either. I think because it just concentrates more and more and more into the uh, mega squads of the, of the big teams i think it would be a, a very bad thing for like uh, general uh, competitive balance in the league but in in terms of covid and um, there's absolutely no impact at all on analytics and um, because analytics everybody can just work from home anyway so <laughs> it's you know so every michael Adams has got his bloody lab palace in his house and all the other guys still doing their stuff and you know maybe you couldn't work in a hadron collider anymore but <laughs> <laughs> and Mo, what about you? Uh, and it can't be anything to do with 40 minute halves or no fans at the game. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, just not a simple one like banging elbows instead of the usual kind of uh, greetings that they normally come out with. So. <laughs> nice, easy ones. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's move on to some questions from uh, Ali Galinho on uh, Discord. He's got one for you, Mo. And he said, uh, would a double swoop for Timo Werner and, Werner and Jadon Sancho this upcoming transfer window be financially feasible for the club? And now, I guess the answer to this may have changed. I think you've asked this one before. <laughs> yeah, well, um, as, could Liverpool do it if they really wanted to? Yes, they could, despite what's going on at the moment. The reason why is because um, with... 
large transfer deals these days, uh, you do big clubs like Liverpool are able to go to funders to basically finance deals. So if Liverpool wanted to really sign both those players and get a funder to pay those transfer fees, they could do that, but then they'd have a very large liability to pay off over the next several years. So the likelihood of signing both of them, I think, is extremely, extremely small. Um, I think with Werner, yes, Sancho, given what Dortmund won, highly unlikely. I don't think so. Interesting. Now, Dave, you had something you wanted to add to that last question, so we'll come back to you there, but I'll throw in another question that came in specifically from Ali for you, and he says, uh, if that deal, if Mo say in that deal would happen and the club could financially afford it, what would you imagine their roles would be in the best attack in the world? Um, so, Werner's an awkward fit. He doesn't ideally fit into how we operate in his natural role, as people like think of him, as a nine. Now, for Leipzig, he does play on the left of a front three, but their front three is not like ours. They play a one and a two. And he plays... All, it's almost more of an, like a like a floating attacking midfield wing slash hybrid type thing that he plays. He doesn't ideally fit into how we operate. He, he, he's not an ideal fit as our nine. He needs more space in behind than we tend to get. He's not the type of player who you know drops off selflessly to draw defenders and, and create space for the wide players. It's not his game. Where he could fit really well is in Mane's role. Now, I'm not advocating replacing Mane with Werner because that's a step down. But what I could potentially see us doing is replacing Werner, or sorry, replacing Firmino with Werner with Mane moving into the middle role. We've seen over the last season and a little bit where if Origi's in the team, he's generally left wing and Mane plays through the middle. I think if Mane plays through the middle with Werner on the left, that really could be effective. Sancho, if he comes in, is automatically just a wide player. He can play either side. He's not quite at the level of R2 yet. I don't think he goes anywhere this summer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he re-upped his contract at Dortmund, got a little bit more money in the short term and set a buyout for next summer where it's maybe a hundred. 100 million rather than the 130, 140 that was talked about uh, pre lockdown. So I think Werner can fit. I just think it will involve a little bit more of him reshaping his game into a position he hasn't really played before, but has played similar enough roles. Like he played left wing for Stuttgart. He's playing that inside left role at Leipzig. Obviously, plays as a nine as well for Leipzig in the national team. But that left-sided role where Mane plays, that's probably his best role for us. Just on the last question, Dan mentioned about not extending the benches. I wouldn't be against extending the benches, but only if it's academy players only. Where, mm. you know, nice. just just to promote young players and get them. It doesn't matter if they're not getting on the pitch. If they're getting to train with the first team, we know that when you know, our new training ground is open, there's going to be more interaction between the academy and the first team. I think if you're having those players involved in the match day and, and getting them in that mindset of what takes place on the match day, what takes place in the dressing room, what it's like to be around Virgil van Dijk, what it's like to be around Mo and and Mane and, and, and these world-class players and what their kind of match day routines is, I think that can only be promising. Look at the, pro the, the, the progress of, of Harvey Elliott Kiana Hoiver and Curtis Jones over the last 12 months from their involvement. Nico Williams, another one. All of these guys have taken massive leaps forward. I can only see that continuing. If you could maybe, maybe it's like, even if they keep it as a seven, but two of them have to be from the academy or go to a nine-man bench with three from the academy. Uh, like Dan, I don't want to see this thing of 11-man benches where all of a sudden, you know, City have 350 million worth of talent sitting on the bench. You know, because that you know that's what will happen. Um, and United will do the same and they'll be paying like, I don't know, 350 grand a week yeah. to David De Gea's cousin just to keep De Gea happy. 
<laughs> very good uh, we'll move on to another one for mo we realize mo's obviously most pressed for time so i want to get all his questions in i will come back to another one that ali had for simon uh shortly but mo this is from uh this is from ross in glasgow and he says uh will the global pandemic potentially have a diverse effect on liverpool's revenue sharing kit deal with nike could fsg be regretting that now thinking more towards a traditional fixed fee plus bonuses contract the likes of new balance were offered offering would that have been a better option uh considering obviously this hindsight of this global pandemic will it have an impact without question um you know needless to say so many people affected by what's going on at the moment that uh people simply will not be able to spend the amount of money um over the next few months over the next year couple of years as they were able to do pre-lockdown so in that regard very very simply um there will be an impact will the club be regretting the deal i don't think so necessarily i think they f- probably still feel that it's a very good deal but clearly it was a very incentive incentivized deal so it was very dependent on sales and volumes that are going through online and other stores so if the amount of sales is lower needless to say then um that means that the uh amount of money that the night deal will generate will also be less as well and that will Im- have an impact in the, in that kind of a situation clearly prefer the certainty of a guaranteed sum so for example nike also have a deal with chelsea it guarantees 60 million a year and under the current circumstances liverpool probably would trade that for the next season but this is a longer term deal it's a five-year deal and they know okay next season it might not be quite as sweet but two three years down the line when hopefully things are back to normal that's when it should start paying dividends. So I think that, you know, this is a club that very much thinks in the longer term. So I don't think they'll be unduly panicking over the current situation. OK, cool. Another one from uh, Ross in Glasgow. This one's for you, Simon. He uh, says, with a return to action in June, the, the date talked about, would that be much different for players who weren't injured before this enforced outbreak to those who were? For example, Rashford and Kane will likely just be thrown straight back in with z- zero opportunity for that phrase that we always hear, match fitness. What is match fitness, Si? Tell us about that, because obviously that's not going to be afforded to these guys. So explain to me who, apart from, uh, I'd actually like to have this conversation with uh, Steve McManaman, who is uh, match fit. Where is the advantage line in there? So everybody's coming in with without playing a single match for eight, for what will be 12 weeks at the time. Um, and I, I don't, yeah, it's nothing. It's, it's a big advantage that players like Harry Kane, like Alisson for us, are going to come back and they're going to be as fit as everybody else. So, um yeah, there's no there's no big advantage for anybody, I think. Apart from we've got Allison's, it's always an advantage. <laughs> and going back to the one from Ali that was for for Sai as well. Uh, this is a uh, this is kind of kind of I think we've kind of passed this one, Ali, in some ways because Jurgen Klopp has signed a new contract and he wants to know uh, from Sai and Dave. Uh, the, the names that could potentially succeed Jurgen Klopp. Now, this is real crystal ball stuff because we're, uh, we're 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 looking a long way down the line. We don't know who the next big thing could be or who our potential options would be. But he says he hears a lot of mentions for the likes of uh, a Pep Linders takeover or the name Julian Nagelsmann. He's hearing quite a lot as well. Is there any of them or any other candidates that you've seen that sort of as up and coming managers that you think would be the perfect fit for Liverpool in what is it four or five years time? I mean, I, I think we're real crystal ball stuff here. Clue. Dave, Dave cares about this stuff way more than I do. I have no idea. If you just think back to who's going to replace Fergie before Fergie got, <laughs> who's going to have like uh, Steve Bruce, Brian Robson was going to be absolutely cast iron. He was the guy going to replace him, and like all of all of Fergie's ex players. And look, like, that's the cap. and in the end they got Moyes. So <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and look, we have a potential, you know, Brian Robson. Let's see how he does. Oh, look, he's doing well at Middlesbrough. Oh, no, they've been relegated. He's actually not very good. Uh, we have one of them sitting out there, sitting at Rangers right now, doing an appalling job, um, blaming the media for everything, throwing players under the bus, playing a horrendous style of football. If Steven Gerrard is your pick to be Liverpool manager, please don't ever speak to me again. Um for me, Nagelsmann is the obvious one because he's just had such a meteoric rise. The job he did at Hoffenheim was incredible. He's doing very, very well at Leipzig. Um, his age obviously lends itself to being a long-term kind of you know, appointment. 
I think from a, from a, a tactical innovation point of view, him and Pep and Linders together could be very, very special. And their styles, their preferred you know formations, preferred styles of play, they link up very, very well. Um, I think Marco Rose at um, at Gladbach is is worth strong consideration. He is, you know, a, a, he's a, a Klopp apostle. He absolutely adores Klopp. Played from at Mines, knows him very, very well. If you watch Gladbach play, there's so many different things they do that we do. Um, there's, I mean, there's a bunch of guys out there, but it it depends on what you want. Like it's going to depend on what you want at that time. If you want the potential successor who's going to come in initially not change too much but over time you know evolve the squad then probably Marco Rose makes sense as the most obvious fit with with Linder staying um just you know to aid the transition if you want someone that's going to come in there's similar principles but the overall scheme of things is going to be quite different on the pitch Nagelsmann is the one that makes sense but if you want to make a splash if you want to just say, look, we've had one of the best managers in the world, we're going to keep doing that. We're going to get someone else who's one of the very best. Antonio Conte or Simeone are probably the only two because you're never going to tempt Pep. You're never going to want Mourinho anymore. Conte and Simeone are, are the two biggest names other than Klopp. So, you know, my pick would be Nagelsmann. I just think he makes the most sense. Age, tactical innovation, development of players. I just think he makes all the sense. I just just want to, my two pennies on this one is, is that um, we've often done the thing in recent years where we've we've now started going beyond the obvious choice and looking for, so the, the place that we would go to, we, we go to the place that they will get their players from. So instead of going to Leipzig, why don't we go straight to Salzburg and go for Jesse March? Because he's, is he the one to keep an eye on as well? Because he's, he's in the, he's in the Leipzig factory now, isn't mm. he? So in, in, the, in the Red Bull factory. And, you know, I was very impressed with him um, you know, with 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 Salzburg, the way they played, but obviously it's a lot. You know, it's five years. In, in That's it. It's a long time. Like, and it's it's hard to know. Like, I mean, he's he's as things stand, it doesn't look like he's going to win the Austrian Bundesliga. Ooh. Um, that would be they, they're second as far as I can, as far as I can remember, they're second in the Bundesliga, which would be a big failure on their behalf. Yeah. Um, it would be seen as drastic. But from from an innovation point of view, from a development point of view. He's he's super highly rated. Like you say, he's in that Red Bull system. Marco Rose was in it as well. Rose was at Salzburg. Everyone thought he'd get the Leipzig job, but they decided to go for Nagelsmann, who was you know the, the shiny toy, and and Rose took the job at, at Gladbach. But yeah, Jesse Marsh has done. I mean, when you see the youth development and how how well you know Haaland came along this season, yeah, the the jump in Minamino. Um, you know, Dominic Sosbalaya, what he's accomplished this season and a couple of these other good kids. Yeah, from that point of view, Jesse Marsh absolutely is in the conversation. And, and as you said, five years is a long time. There's going to be someone who's working at, as we speak as an academy coach or as an assistant manager somewhere who's waiting for an opportunity, who will get an opportunity somewhere and who everybody will step back and go, wow, like this guy is is phenomenal. So... Yeah, there's there's definitely the Werder Bremen coaches were keeping an eye on, an eye on as well. Great, thanks, guys. Uh, coming back to Sai, uh, this is a question from Stephen Wensley Sai, and he wants to know uh, how effectively can teams train in small, socially distanced groups of four or five? From a physical perspective, it's not it's no no different to any day of the week. Um, so there's 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 no real um, barriers there. Um, but from it gives us a bit of an advantage given how uh, how well our system is is learned, developed, and refined. How often they've been doing this for years now. So it, it would just be second nature coming back in. So um, it will be a tactical issue rather than a physical one. Uh, playing in five, and 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 don't believe the hype. It will be for five days at most. They'll be back in norm. It'll be normal by the week. <laughs> the side bringing things uh, back to ground as normal. <laughs> well, so we were watching the Bundesliga this weekend. There was, there was nobody was shirking any tackles. It was there was some there was some proper juicy stuff, wasn't there? I mean, there was well, like the BT there. Sport commentators seemed to imply that they were. Did anyone else pick that up? They were, yeah, they I saw, think- I think the first ten minutes of the Dortmund game was a bit cagey, but in some of the other games I watched, there was some. It was it was like okay, this was like a normal. It's just like just like steaming into each other. So like you know, I think the players are just operating on instinct, and just and once they get out back on that pitch, it doesn't really matter. 
Good stuff. Another one from Ross in Glasgow. This is for Mo. We'll let Mo answer this one and then he can shoot off to uh, to get that first edition of the Financial Times. Mo, uh, he wants to know uh, what what level will clubs start to be affected by uh, a lack of attendance at games? Uh, Sai has been on another show uh, recently and he said to me that the uh, his feelings are that we may not see fans inside grounds again until the start of the 21-22 season. You know what I mean? That's a, a massive uh, a massive period of waiting before fans are in stadiums. What level will clubs be massively affected by that? Are we talking Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two? Where does that pinch really start to be felt? Well, I mean, for the leagues lower down, we're talking um, potentially going out of business territory. Um, now, the lower leagues, League One and League Two in particular, match day income is their biggest revenue earner. TV money compared to match day is, is relatively meagre. Um, so that would be the death knell for so many of these clubs, unless there's some other way to keep them afloat financially. So that, that's how big an impact they would be. For the championship clubs, um, they already deal in very difficult financial circumstances. Many of them have wages, wage bills alone, which exceed revenue. Some of them have wages to turnover ratio of 150 percent, things, you know, ridiculous ratios like that. They also would be in very deep trouble. Even a number of Premier League clubs would be in uh, a lot of problems as well. Um, but for Liverpool, um, match day revenue plus some of the commercial through the shop on a match day. Um, you know, we're, we're coming close to a £100 million hit. And um, so with that kind of money, um, Liverpool would be able to sustain this, the wage bill. They would be able to sustain other things, but spending on transfers um, and then all the installments that come with that, um, they'd have very little money to spend um, on transfer dealings. Uh, and that's why... Not only Liverpool, but I think a lot of the other Premier League clubs need to look at alternatives to match their revenue. And one of the things for me is about going to the broadcasters and saying, OK, well, for these matches that are not normally shown on TV, the three o'clock Saturday games, can we have the ability to sell the rights for those games via the Internet or other things? And that might help across, you know, on a global stage, mm. generate, you know, maybe a million, two million pound per match. And mm. that will at least help to mitigate the, off, uh, the, the impact of £80 million pound of match day revenue being lost. We, me and Gags talked about this on, on Old School recently. And w- what we were suggesting was, if you take... Because obviously, like, you know, Sky and BT, they've, they've bought their games. They, they know what games they're getting. If you could take some of the other games that are there and sell them to BBC or ITV, uh, you know... A Tuesday night game or a Thursday night game or whatever, or, you know, Saturday, Saturday, 3 p.m., whatever it is, sell those games to your terrestrial broadcasters and take that money, specifically that money, and give it directly to the EFL to split between the clubs and filter that money down through the chain. Because, mm. yeah. like Mo said, we are at a massive risk of clubs like Chesterfield, clubs like, you know, Shrewsbury, who we played in the Cup. There's a bunch of these clubs that could very seriously go out of business. We could look at, I mean, everybody saw how heartbreaking it was to watch what happened to Bury last summer, what almost happened to Bolton. This summer, we could have, what, five of them? There could be five, six. Mm -hmm. And these are not fly-by-night clubs. These are historic clubs that date back to the 1800s. These are clubs with great tradition, incredible local fan bases, you know, fantastic old-style, old-school stadiums where you get a very different match-going experience than you do at Anfield or Old Trafford with the glitz and the glamour. At these older grounds, there's just something magical about them. And as you know, fans of a Premier League club, we only really get to see them if we go to an away cup game or whatever. Or if you live local, you might go. But I think it's a real opportunity for the Premier League to say, look, we actually do care about the rest. Because without the rest, there's nothing holding us up. If we're not, if we don't have, you know, it's not just having all these clubs. It's the potential for all these players and what could happen to those players. A lot of them might just leave the game altogether. You could get academies that shut down and players are just that distressed that they just walk away from the game. And then the future of the game starts to take a hit. So I think if we can sell some of those games to BBC, ITV, Facebook, Amazon, whoever, filter that money back down through the, the, the table. 
Yeah, so well you, said. you had a point. You had a point there, say on Derby. Oh yeah, only that the David's talking even lower down and championships clubs. They, they, if if there's no fans in for next season, championship clubs. I, I would even go as far as saying a little bit more than half of them will go bust. Wow, that's that's incredible. That is a proper doomsday that's picture. That's scary, man. Yeah. We'll, we'll say I'm farewell sure to Mo. We'll let Mo. Uh, we'll let Mo shoot off because he has to. Uh, he has to leave us now. See you, Mo. Uh, so thank thank you, <laughs> Mo, for joining us, and we'll, uh, Mo will be back imminently for money talks. I'm sure as this uh, doomsday picture that Simon just uh, nicely presented to us there <laughs> materializes. <laughs> I'll get. I'll, I'll throw another question at you, Sai, as uh, you seem to have sorted your sound issues. And this one comes from uh, our man in Madrid, Adam Petrucioni. Adam wants to know if you were the if you were the head physio at Liverpool Football Club right now, and they clinch the Premier League quickly when football does resume, would you be recommending that to, to Jurgen Klopp that they sit out their key players until the next season actually resumes? No, no, no. They're footballers. The play. They're humans and. The thing they do, they like to do in the world is to play football. The thing they get re- intrinsic psychological reward from is being good at football. There are records they'll be chasing. They they want to be legends. They want to be as they love this whole thing of actually kicking a ball around. You're going to take that out off them after you've you've stopped. You've taken it off them for twelve weeks already. It just, it's just it doesn't make any sense at all. People are talk. I understand where the thinking comes from, but you, like you're playing championship manager, no chance that Mo Salah is giving up eight games and Sadi. You imagine Mane. You're taking eight games off him for finishing top yeah. scorer in the league. <laughs> nah, no. Um, and, but on top of that, right, you have to also factor in where next season, the planning for next season, is going to sit. So what people aren't on. Uh, um, really computing is that tomorrow there will be uh, a lot of the talk tomorrow will be how does this sit alongside next season and that next season theoretically is going to start I think it's 26th of August so how does the physical preparation for this and then the what is the physical cost of this season in for uh, leading into next season so so what, what was what's going to happen is the eight weeks we've had is going to be pre-season for next season we're going to almost carry on there'll, there'll be like a two-week mid-season break Ugh, not really and it will just go straight into next season yeah good answer si. uh this is for dan kennett and for simon brundish it comes from simon gillis at the old reeky reds in edinburgh my good friend simon and he says uh there's been lots of discussion about liverpool's greatest 11 during lockdown in all the reminiscence pieces if you go with a from the head and not the heart approach would the best team squad purely based on stats differ much from the popular selections we tend to see uh yes it would be almost exclusively the current team wow I really, as, as as black and white as that, then? Um, well, in terms of the, in terms of the goals spread across the front three, they're all a shoe in. You could argue, yeah. The, I mean, Jan and um, Steve both said uh, Rushy early on on the first pod. No question, he you know he would replace the goals overall. But the question is, is what would be the output <laughs> of the front? What would be the front three overall? What would be the output of the, those three combined? And in terms of the defence, I mean, we've reached we've reached defensive levels that you know are as good as what we saw under Julio and Benitez. And you know, okay, we'll never be able to compare with um, you know Liverpool going conceding four goals at Anfield in all of 1978-79 season because there's no back pass rule anymore. You know, so it it, it is completely different. But we've re- we've reached a level of defensive performance with 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 Virgil. And um, and Allison particularly, that you know the, these guys are all time legit, and I, it doesn't matter if it's only once. Well, okay, it's because I I don't think it's just this season. I count last season because last season was historically the best season we've had, but we just didn't win the league. Mm-hmm. Now, Sai, you're massively in agreement with what Dan said there. I mean, I saw you commenting earlier when Jan and Steve were talking. But is there anything else to add to your feeling that you just back up everything Dan just said? Statistically, there's no great argument. The the arguments would be like Sunes would come in midfield, and mm. uh, I think it'd be possible to argue with that. You'd probably yeah. put Steve in midfield, and you wouldn't have any argument. Like it, it statistically, it's impossible to argue for our midfield. It defensively, there would always be discussion around Hansen, but Joe Gomez might be the best defender we've ever had. Statistically, he looks like it. We we you know we're not looking at that. We can't say that for sure at all. But um. 
statistically, you can't argue with that. And Bobby, any you could you could pick any of the Liverpool great strikers from the past, down to Dalglish or Keegan. Uh, Bobby is kind of just a bit worse statistically than those two. But any of the other great strikers from from the last forty years have better numbers than Bobby. Mm-hmm. Would the system work as well without him? But if you're look, you're talking exclusively numbers, you would probably you would bring in a, one of the other strikers, and you know it's Luis or Luis Suarez, but. And Dave, you're more with the uh, eyes than you are with the numbers generally. What do you, what, what are your feelings on what the guys have said there? Yeah, I, I agree with what the guys are saying. I think the front the front three. It's about the performance of all three. You know, the like guys mentioned earlier on, Ian Rush, and yes, purely from a goal scoring point of view, Ian Rush is going to add more goals to the team than than Bobby Firmino. But. Are Mane and Mo going to get the same amount of goals with Rush as they are with Bobby? My answer would be no, I don't think they would. So I think you either go with Bobby or you go with somebody who can do 90% of what Bobby can do and then add the goals on top of it. And Sai just mentioned Luis Suarez. He he is the one I would argue could do that role even better than Bobby. Um, so I think Suarez comes in like the guys mentioned, the back four, I think I think it's it stays as it is. There's a case for Hansen. He's probably the best defender we've ever had from a, a performance point of view and, and the longevity. Like I said, what, what these guys are doing now is historic. Um, the midfield is the one area where there would be change without question. I mean, this midfield is... F- Fabinho's great, but the rest of it is very, very average. Um, Sunes, of course, comes in. You know, there's an argument for Gerrard, for sure. There's an argument you could play Barnes in a midfield three. Um, Mascherano, there's, you know, Steve McMahon, Ronnie Whelan. There's, we've had an awful lot of great midfielders through the years, so, all of whom could fill the roles that Klopp asked yeah. them to do. So the midfield is where you would make the big changes. Okay, we've got just over 10 minutes to go before we uh, hand back over to the ragamuffins. And uh, I want to get two more questions in for the full panel, uh, if we can, before we go. And uh, it's another one from Stephen Wensley. I'll start with Simon again on this. Uh, Simon, obviously, is from a, a business perspective as well as a uh, as, as well as well a fitness perspective, this one. He says, uh, if a player refuses to play because of COVID, should you continue to earn or pay their full <laughs> I think I think Darth will have a, uh, a probably a, a better <laughs> answer than me. But um, my f- fundamental belief is uh, no. If you were a teacher and you refused to go to work, then unless you could prove that you were sick, then you wouldn't get paid. Um, and in this current climate, there is a chance that if you worked in an office, you might you might be able to get furloughed. But if if work is open and they and the government. Um, you hit the, the 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 employer hits all of the government's criteria to um, get your COVID secure status. Go to work, dude. Go on, Dan. Well, it's not just a football problem, is it, Eddie? It's a it's a it's a, it's a every industry in the UK problem. Um, the issue is is that footballers are much higher paid than um, everybody else in the UK uh, the kingdom. Um, it, it, it's it's such a tricky one. If the situation has come to that, um, that industry is considered open and all the relevant parties, the government, governing bodies, plus the unions and everybody else has agreed to go back to work. You are then, as an individual, completely reliant on acts of good faith from your employer, really, to, to then say, yeah, we'll continue to pay you in full as a conscientious observer. But that it's not really going to last for very long. I don't think even the most great, you know, na- good natured of employees, you're going to have to have some special circumstances like you live with, with, with your grandparents or something like that. Um, now I'm sure there are footballers who live with their grandparents, but I don't think there's any playing for Liverpool and there's probably very few in the Premier League in that situation. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, this is a societal problem. And this is going to be a big story for the, for the back half of uh, 2020 in, in everybody. 
And it's amazing, Dave, we've hardly heard any of that from Germany. I, I do read some of the stuff that's been going on in Germany just with a sort of half glance, but we haven't seen any of that from the German clubs that are in the bottom three and potentially about to be relegated. But yet we're seeing it constantly from players that are in the bottom three uh, in England and uh, some of the top players as well. In fairness, obviously, we've heard from Raheem Stell and Sergio Aguero and guys like that recently as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough situation. Um, it doesn't help that the UK's response to this has been, you know, an abject failure and that they, it's the, true. The, the government are literally making it up as they go along and then trying to rewrite history at the same time. Um, whereas in Germany, you've got a very competent leader. You've got maybe the best leader in, in the world right now in Angela Merkel and, and their way of, dealing with, with COVID has been just so much better than it has in the UK and not to laugh because it's been, it's been fairly poor here as well. Like, but I don't know, should, should you pay the wages? No, is, is the answer? No, you shouldn't. They get paid to play. They don't get paid to sit at home. Um, I'm not sure I agree with paying them the last 12 weeks or whatever. Um, in full. Yeah, in full, I don't, I don't agree with it. I think they should have been paid a percentage. Like, everyone else, like, especially here, like, we all got furloughed. We got paid a percentage of our wage. You get the same money to sit at home. Um, I, but at the same time, I don't think it's right to force a player. But let's be very, very clear. No Premier League player is going to fall on hard times by not getting their full wage for... A couple of weeks, not going to happen. They they live in a different world than we live in. If we don't get paid, you know, our mortgage doesn't get paid, our our rent doesn't get paid, our our bills don't get paid, our loans don't get paid, whatever. They I don't have that kind of worry, you know. So I I don't know is the answer to be honest. I don't think they should be paid their full wage. Absolutely not. But I don't think if a player turns around and says, "No, look, I don't want to play," <coughs> I don't think they should be vilified for it. I think no. it's an awful lot to ask these players to go risk getting um, getting COVID and then giving it to their families. I, I don't understand. Like, I haven't seen any real plan on how this is going to work. I don't think it's going to work in Germany. I think we're going to end up seeing it shut down or, or, you know, an awful lot of cases come out of it. We've already seen Dinamo Dresden, the whole squad had to go in to, uh, to quarantine. I think we're going to see more of that. The only way... I can see to do it and do it properly is to hold it all in one place, which is probably St. George's where you have all the teams there and you lock everybody down until the season's over. But I'm also of the camp that next season shouldn't start till January. I don't think we should see football after this season's done. I don't want to see it till January line everything up. Then it runs right into the world cup Mm -hmm. in 2022 that's global, the way I global calendar. It. Yeah, exactly. I just think yeah. it works better. You can push, you can push the Euros and the Copa Libertador, uh, Copa America to next winter. They can come at the end of next season. The Afcon will be January, so yeah, it'll be before the season, but that's fine. I think you just run it right through, and then it lines up with the World Cup, and then you can make a decision. Look, do we want to go back to the old way, or do we want to stick with this way? They'll probably go back the old way, but I don't think the idea of playing next season from September or, or October, not giving the players much of a break and playing it without fans. I, I just like the football has been crap without fans. I watched, I watched the game yesterday, Dortmund Schalke it should be one of the biggest games in the world. Didn't enjoy it at all. Watched Inter Juve before the lockdown. One of the biggest games in the world, no fans M- might as well. have gone down the road and watched a bunch of lads play kick about <coughs> on a local pitch. The, that's just it. It doesn't, while the players are still playing with the same intensity, it just seems like a training match. And I, I, for me, it's it's not really something I want to watch a whole bunch of. This season's fine, but I don't want to see that crap next season. No way. I want to see next season start in January, February. And maybe for the first couple of months, you don't have any fans, and that's fine. And you can start to, to build it up. You know, if you start the season in February with, you know, a 10,000 capacity in a 50,000 stadium, that's fine. And build it and build it and build it until you get back to normal. But I, I think they're just they're literally just rushing to try and get things back without any real direction. It's a bit of a mess. So, Eddie, yeah. just, just just want to say quickly is that the um, Dave's answer 
and the question before the question itself was basically um it's a shame mo wasn't here because it all depends on whether um there can be some kind of agreement reach with TV. TV mm. need to flex on this because, but the same because they are the they are the money tap. They are the paymasters for the players' wages. And if if you can't get an agreement with TV, then you you you're in wage deferrals, you're in wage cuts, or you're basically trying to run a season from September just, just basically because TV mm. won't flex with you. So yeah, there's going to have to be some big big negotiations and big agreements. Yeah, that one does completely come down to tv i mean dave's answer as sensible as it is in a in an ideal world that's perfectly succinct and that's exactly what should happen but you just know that money dictates that 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 is just something that they just don't want to do and that's why this next season seems to be so sacrosanct to everyone that you hear speaking about it they don't want to touch next season i mean i think they're in cloud cuckoo land if they think next season's not going to be affected but let's just see how that one rolls out now we are almost done i have got a light-hearted one i i know you've asked an excellent set of questions top and I'm going to come back to them on another show at another time. They're, they're all to do with rebuilding, and that's really one for Dave Hendrick and Carl Matchett on AI Scouted. So I will get There's to that. There's his next agenda. Scott- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scott Chandler asked a, a really good question as well, and I will get that to Dave and to, and to Carl for a scout show. They, they do take questions quite regularly, so they'll be able to do that. So just in finishing up, and this one uh, is for Dave, and uh, it comes from Trev Downey, Dave. Uh, and Trev hasn't spoken to you in a while. I, I know you're planning a show at some point. Uh, it was talked about as we went into lockdown that you two would yeah. be getting together. But Trev wants to kick it off with this one. And he says, uh, if you could choose one Irishman from history, from the massive tapestry of Irish history to manage <laughs> Liverpool, who would it be? And he puts it, he gives you a couple of answers to, to, to Stu on. He says, you or me? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's me. <laughs> of course there. it is. Danny's going to go in there and he's going to be too nice. I mean, look, Danny's the nice guy of the of the group. And Trev's going to go in, he's going to be like Roy Evans. It's all going to be real nice to watch. But at the end of the day, he's going to finish fifth. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to rule with three things. Fear, violence, and fear of violence. And if you don't think I'm bringing home some silverware, you're crazy. And the only alternative to me from our great history in Ireland is Michael Collins because <laughs> again who's not going to play their best when he's got 11 assassins stood next to him going you can either play well or you're having a chat with them boys so that's it brilliant brilliant so that was a light hearted solution I hope Trev will be happy with the answer I'm sure he will be uh, sitting in his uh, field in urban Ireland uh, now the uh, it's, it's just the, a garden uh, it's just a garden it's not a, it's it's a big garden because he's because he's got loads of money he calls it a field but it's a big garden I have a field <laughs> Dave you need to back it up with photos and videos that's the issue here Listen, I know they're going to take about three weeks to upload but <laughs> that's the problem that's the problem Tandon has seen Tandon has seen the country manor <laughs> so um, but yeah, definitely make sure you send send me those questions across, Eddie. We'll be recording Scouted yeah. during the week, and yeah, we'll take we'll care of them. them. The, the, the serious the serious answer, Eddie, is uh, is Clough and Taylor. You know, so Dave's going to be Brian Clough there, and mm. and Trev's, Trev's Peter Taylor. Uh, they, yeah, that's it, exactly. It. And it's the blend that works. It's not the individuals on their own. Don't do it. Yeah, very good answer there, Dan. So let's uh, let's finish up uh, before we go uh, over to the Ragamuffins for their first ever recorded version of You'll Never Walk Alone. And then you're going to get Ben Burke uh, from Boss Night. He's going to come on and do about a 45 minute set. All of the top songs uh, that you've heard uh, in recent times, that, that stuff that you heard out in Madrid in the fan park, all of that. Ben's going to do a lot. It's absolutely sensational stuff that you're going to get from Ben. So do keep it tuned. And then there'll be Late Night Desi with uh, with Gags Tandon, Cam Branch, and uh, Harinder Singh probably singing. So, uh, uh, you have all of that to uh, to look forward to, Stella. The the stuff that we've seen, uh, we all commented on it. It's been excellent so far. And thank you, everyone, for supporting us and for watching this. Uh, thank you, first of all, to Mo Chatra, who, uh, who we lost uh, around 20 minutes ago. Mo will be back with more Money Talks podcast soon. Thank you ever so much to Simon Brandish, our sports scientist. He'll be on Under Pressure again very soon. Thanks to Dan Kennett, our statistician. He'll be... We'll be giving him the numbers, the viewing figures. He'll be comparing that to all sorts of other things, like what well, the TV viewing was for songs of for songs of praise tonight, matching up things and seeing how it all compares. And uh, he'll come up with some excellent statistical analysis. And, and thank you to the wonderful Dave Hendrick for his uh, his chirpings as well and that fantastic last answer there for Mr. Trev Downey. Thank you, guys. Picture you can see behind Dan Kenneth. That's not a background. That is literally just reams of numbers. 
spooling away. And, it's like the and Matrix. That's what, yeah, and that's what it all looks like. That's the reflection from Dan's eyes that you can see. That's how he deciphers things. <laughs> <laughs> and for more of these guys... Of Dave, that, that photo of Dave is just is where he's in the queue in, uh, for, to, to audition for Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> that's an old... That's, that's my short beard as well. <laughs> that was when he was six Three years old. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for watching everyone for more of these guys and they are fantastic they are proper deep dive guys on, on on liverpool football club and football in general they're all excellent in their own right 30 podcasts a month uh, are roughly uh, anfield index pro you can get 30 days absolutely free and it's anfieldindexpro.com thanks for watching When you walk